This episode goes out to Jesse, best dungeon master ever. Hi there, Garrett Robinson here. Welcome to the 10th episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast Season 3. Hey listener, I just wanted to drop another quick reminder that if the Underrealm books are part of your holiday plans, as a gift for you or for someone else, you should order yours today. This year has played havoc on shipping times in the US and around the world, and it's getting harder and harder to keep books in stock. Bottom line, once I run out of the books I have on hand, I'm not getting any more until next year. So, today's the perfect time to go to underrealm.net slash books and order the Underrealm Full Hardcover Collection. It's 10 awesome books in 4 awesome volumes for one awesome price. Or you could get some books from the Nightblade Epic, the series you're listening to in this show, or any of the incredible Underrealm books on our site. Check them all out at underrealm.net slash books. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today, you're getting chapters 14 and 15 of Darkfire. When we left off, Zane had escaped his bonds, and Jordel had taught Lauren to use the magic of her dagger to track him down. Enjoy! Darkfire, Chapter 14 They rode as hard as they could, which was not as fast as Jordel would have liked, for still the ground was slippery and wet. And besides, Lauren could not press Midnight to go too fast, for it made her head swim and threatened to raise her gorge. Yet still they made good time, much better than Zane could have. Lauren rode at the rear as was her custom, and every so often she would draw forth the dagger to inspect its designs. Always they pointed forwards along the pass, for a long while there was nowhere else to go. Soon, though, the path began to dip, dropping steeply down towards the valley floor. "'Here things will become more difficult,' said Alburn. "'Though I hope the ground is soft enough after the rain to leave good marks where he is passed.' "'I see no marks anywhere,' said Jem, annoyed. "'I would expect no more from a boy who grew up on the cobblestones of a city,' said Jordell. Use the time to sharpen your eyes, Master Urchin. The path reached the valley at last. Alburn called them to a halt and dismounted to inspect the ground. Lauren took advantage of his distraction to draw the dagger again, hiding it beneath her cloak. The designs twisted sharply to the left, away from the path which ran northeast. That way, said Alburn, pointing north. He abandoned the path as soon as it reached the valley floor. How do you know? said Annis, who seemed to share Jem's annoyance. Just there, said Lauren, guiding Midnight up beside the plow horse. See how all the grass stands one way, like the fibers of a rug? Then see that dip, a little more than a slight darkness, where the blades bend differently from those around them. They are in the shape of a footprint, and they continue off that way for some time. I think you are seeing things, growled Jem. But Annis leaned forwards in her saddle with excitement. I see them, she cried. I see the footprints, or at least one of them. Where did you say the others were? They are farther off, said Lauren. Only practiced eyes would spot them. You should take pride in seeing the one. The girl's dark skin flushed a bit darker for the moment, while Jem rolled his eyes in a huff. Alburn led them on, and both the tracks and the dagger pointed north for a long while. The valley floor rose and fell beneath them, and on every crest Lauren looked ahead eagerly, hoping to see Zane's blue coat fleeing across the wilderness. But it never appeared. They rode through midday and for two hours beyond that. Soon the ground grew rocky, and the tracks vanished. We should ride on anyway, said Alburn. There is nowhere to hide, and the valley is rimmed by the mountains. Zane can have gone nowhere but north. Jordel looked to Lauren, and fortunately she had just peeked at the dagger before Alburn stopped them. The design still pointed north. 
She gave Jordell a small nod, and he looked forwards again. But Lauren saw that Albern had witnessed their exchange, and he looked at her most curiously before leading them on. Not an hour later, Albern stopped again and had them dismount. A small cluster of boulders lay just ahead, and stealthily they led their horses to it. Then Albern took Jordell and Lauren forwards to peek around the edge, and they saw what he had spied from afar. A camp waited, may up two spans ahead, very near to the bank of the river that ran up the center of the valley. Some figures clustered around a small fire, resting or eating. From their movements, Lauren knew them for satyrs, and though it was hard to count from so far away, she thought there might have been a half-dozen. She was somehow glad they were too far for her to see what they were eating. Mayup the legends about satyrs devouring children were only legends, and Mayup not. "'I suppose it is futile to try and convince you to go around,' said Albern. "'I know a path that would take us west, circling them out of sight.' "'And how long would that take?' said Jordell. Albern sighed. "'Longer than you would wish, I am certain. "'Very well. I will lead them away from the fire. "'Be ready to ride when I do.' He returned to his horse and seized his bow, and then rode east at a breakneck gallop. Lauren waited by midnight, stroking the horse's neck as she grazed. Jordell stayed by the edge of the boulders to watch for Albern's signal. Then they heard it. A great whooping cry howled across the air towards them, and Lauren ran to stand beside Jordell and watch. Then she saw Albern in battle and witnessed the true power of Kalentin Bowcraft. Albern rode across a narrow ford in the river straight for the satyrs, who leaped up to clutch their spears and bleed at him. But he released his reins and drew his bow, firing arrows like a man possessed. Shaft after shaft cut the air, falling upon the ground around the camp, yet Lauren knew that not one of them missed on accident. He wanted their attention, not their lives. Five arrows flew wide. But they did their job, for the satyrs bounded towards him with a roar. Some had bows and loosed their own arrows after him, but Albern was riding too fast for them to draw aim. After turning one great circle around the outskirts of their camp, he rode off again, guiding his horse back across the river and into the trees on the other side. "'Go! Quickly!' cried Jordell. They leaped atop their horses and rode past the camp. All the while, Lauren looked to the east, hoping the satyrs would not show their faces again among the trees. They did not, and soon the party had left the camp far behind. Jordell had them slow to a walk, and after a few minutes, Albern came riding up from behind them. He had reclaimed his arrows and held them clutched in his fist, inspecting them and returning them to the quiver one by one. "'Not too bad a job,' he remarked, leading his horse to ride beside Jordell. "'That was remarkable,' said Jem. "'You rode like a madman, unleashed.' Albern shrugged. "'It had the required effect. "'Come, we have lost some time.' Lauren snuck a glance at her dagger. Still, its markings pointed straight ahead. She sheathed it and nudged midnight with her heels. Zane's tracks went on and on, nearly due north, against the river's southward flow. Lauren guessed he meant to walk along it as far as he could, for eventually it must lead to some sort of dwelling. There he could hide himself and may up secure a horse to continue his flight. But she wondered that they had not caught him already. Zane had hardly looked fit to stand when last they saw him, and should have been slow and wandering in his escape. A short time later, Albern called them to a halt. Again he dismounted to inspect the ground. Lauren saw what he was looking at, the prince, easy to see in the soft dirt near the river, veered sharply away from the water before disappearing to the west. Quickly she looked at the dagger. The markings still pointed north. He turned aside, said Albern. For what I do not know, mayhap he thinks to hide himself somewhere in the mountain caves. If he does, he has a nasty surprise waiting. This deep in the great rocks, any caves are likely filled with satyrs. We shall ride west. Jordell looked back over his shoulder. Lauren? Albern looked at her curiously, and the children did the same. Lauren flushed, but she kept her eyes on Jordell's. 
We should ride north, she said simply. They all gawked at her, all but Jordell. Alburn turned to him. The tracks are clear. He went west. I trust Lauren in this, said Jordell briskly. We continue north. The bowyer looked at her again, and Lauren saw wonder in his eyes, along with a burning curiosity. But he tried once more. Jordell, it is no concern of mine whether we find this wizard or not. But if you wish to, and you have hired me as your guide, then listen to me. We shall find him west of here, nowhere else. I do not doubt your skill in woodcraft, said Jordell. I ask that you do not doubt my faith in Lauren. If she says Zane is to the north, then north is where we shall find him. Alburn shrugged. Very well. Only do not complain to me later when we have lost much time in this wild hunt and have not found Zane besides. But we shall follow the daughter of the forest, if that be your wish. Lauren swallowed hard, avoiding the eyes of Jem and Annis, who looked at her without understanding. Alburn gained his saddle again, and they rode north. Darkfire, Chapter 15 Alburn guided them forwards more slowly now, for he said the satyrs were thick in this part of the valley. They rarely went faster than a trot, and most of the time it was a cautious walk instead, with their eyes wandering all about, searching for any sign of danger. In a short while, the ground west of them grew hard, though it turned back into silt where they rode. Almost as soon as the rocky ground appeared, Alburn stopped them with a raised hand, he jumped from his bay and ran a short way to the west before kneeling. Curious, Lauren dismounted. Her head spiked with pain at the notion, but she shook it off and went to join the bowyer. When she reached him, Alburn looked up at her with wide eyes and pointed. She saw it, a few small strands of brown cloth and a small dark smudge that looked like blood. "'He fell here,' said Alburn in wonder. "'You were right.' Zane went this way. How did you know? There is much more to this girl than meets the eye, said Jordell, surprising Lauren. He had approached from behind while she studied the markings. She might have heard him coming, if not for the ache in her skull. Now we should hasten, for that mark looks fresh. Indeed, said Alburn as he stood, but he still looked at Lauren. Indeed. Let us move on. They turned the horses to run across the harder terrain, for Zane had stayed on it and avoided the soft soil nearer the river. Every so often now they found a sign of him. It looked as though he was weary and stumbling, for there were many disturbed rocks and smudges of blood. He must have cut his hand, or mayhap it was from the burns he must have suffered when he frayed the rope. Midnight and the other horses began to move faster and faster without urging, feeling the excitement of their riders. Lauren scanned the soil, only checking the dagger every so often, for it always pointed straight ahead. But in their eagerness, they forgot to look up. Suddenly there was a great snap and a roar, and Lauren raised her eyes to see a bolt of fire speeding towards them. She cried out and tugged Midnight's rein sharply to the right. But the mare had already seen the flames, and she veered even before Lauren told her to. Lauren snatched the plow horse's bridle and pulled it along as well, though it moved more slowly. The flame crashed down in the midst of where they had stood. When it struck the ground, it splashed like a great ball of water, throwing fire in every direction. A few embers landed upon the hem of Annis's dress, making her cry out as she beat at it with her hands. Lauren vaulted from Midnight's back, ignoring the jolt of agony from the landing, and ran to the girl. Hastily, she scooped up dirt and threw it at the fire. In a moment, it was out, and she looked for Jordell and Alburn. They had brought their horses around after avoiding the flames. Now Jordell gave a great shout as he spurred his charger forwards. Alburn followed right behind him. "'Stay here and do not move,' Lauren said to Annis. She scrambled back atop midnight and sped off after the men, gritting her teeth at the terrible jostling. The bolt of fire had come from the northwest, just past a great mound in the earth. That is where Jordell and Alburn had gone. Lauren turned her horse south instead, circling the mound from the other side. In her mind's eye, she saw again the day she and Zane had met. 
He had fled from her in the forest, and she had caught him by passing through a copse of birch trees he had avoided. I have grown much since the birchwood, but you have learned little, my wizard, she thought with a grim smile. From the other side of the mound she heard Jordell yelling at Albern not to kill Zane. Then she heard another blast and eruption of flames, followed by a cry. Her heart skipped a beat. Had Zane struck Jordell with his flames? Or Albern? It did not matter. Not yet, at any rate. She could only ride on. Soon she passed the mound and steered midnight to the right, and then she saw him. Zane ran across the open ground a few dozen paces ahead. He was making for the feet of the mountains to the west, where Lauren saw a great many caves, but no satyrs. Zane looked back and saw her then, his eyes glowing white. He did not stop, but thrust an arm behind himself and spoke a word. A bolt of lightning crackled forth, thunder threatening to burst her eardrums as it split the air. Lauren flinched, her reflexes far slower than the lightning itself, but unnecessarily, for the spell split apart and struck the ground on either side of Midnight's hooves. The horse shrieked with fear, but they were unscathed. The dagger would not let Zane's magic touch them. She reached him a moment later and tried to dive from the saddle, but the motion made white sparks of pain dance in her vision, and she lost her balance. Zane fell beneath her with a crash, but she could not wrap her arms around him. They rolled across the grass and landed paces apart. The wizard scrambled up at once, shooting flames at her. Though Lauren knew he could not harm her, her instincts did not. She hugged the dirt in fear as the flames dissipated harmlessly a few feet away, giving Zane time to find his feet and resume his run. Thundering hooves sounded, and Albert and Jordell drew near. They looked harried but unharmed. Their horses carried them past Lauren after Zane, but they could not reach him before he vanished into one of the caves that opened upon the valley floor. Lauren heard Albert shout a warning, but Jordell did not heed it. He dropped from his saddle once his charger stopped before the cave, drawing his sword and running in after Zane. Alburn took a moment longer, knocking an arrow before following. Lauren ran after them, one hand on her head and the other on her dagger, but she did not draw it, for Alburn might turn around at any moment. She entered the cave and found a scene of madness. Just before her stood Jordel and Alburn, weapons out as they faced Zane. The wizard stood a few paces beyond, right hand extended with flame burning in his palm, but his left hand showed flame in the other direction, deeper into the cave, where a clan of satyrs watched in fear. There were dozens of them, many the size of small children, with some others clustered around and holding them close, their parents, Lauren guessed. Before these stood yet more of the creatures, and these were larger and thickly muscled, holding weapons of every kind. They stood between Zane and the children, braying angrily at his intrusion. They looked ready to attack at any provocation. Zane, if you do not leave with us now, they will kill you, said Jordel. Douse your flames and come. No, mystic, spat Zane. I will not go with you, not again, not ever. I would sooner die in this cave and let all of you burn with me. That was all the satyrs needed. The warriors pounced, thrusting spears and swinging axes of stone. Jordel charged, keeping one eye on Zane while fending off the goat men with his sword. Alburn fired a flurry of arrows, but he struck only in the legs and arms, felling the satyrs without slaying them. Zane had no such compunctions. He let loose with a wave of flame that tore into the warriors. They fell to the ground, bleeding in fear, beating at the flames with their hands and rolling around the cave floor to douse themselves. The children screamed still louder. No! cried Lauren. Lauren! shouted Jordel. Stop him! She understood at once. With the dagger, she was the only one who could attack Zane without fear. Gritting her teeth against the pain, she ran at him, boots pounding on the stony floor before she covered the last few feet in a great leap. Zane's head slammed into the rocks as he fell, and his eyes rolled back in his head, but he fought to keep his senses. Again he worked his flames on her, but they had no more effect than they had outside the cave. Seized by madness, he scrabbled for her face with his fingernails. Lauren seized his wrists and twisted them, making Zane cry out in pain. Then she flipped him over and got his arm behind his back, shoving it towards his shoulder blades until he screamed. 
She wrapped her elbow around his throat, dragging him upwards to stand before her, helpless. When he struggled, she only raised his hand behind his shoulder blades until she nearly broke his arm. She tightened her grip on his throat to keep him from speaking, and his flames died in his hands. "'I have him!' she cried. "'Then go!' said Jordel, backing towards her, his blade flashing in the sunlight that shone in from outside. The satyrs drew back for a moment, giving space for a fighting retreat. Alburn stilled his bowstring, though he held another arrow drawn, waiting for a threat at which to loose it. Jordel held his blade forwards. The fight had not gone from the goatmen. Their eyes glittered as they waited for an opportunity. A moment later they were outside, and Jordel snatched Zane away from her. Then he did something Lauren had never seen before. With one arm around Zane's neck, he twisted his fingers into a curious shape and pressed them to the wizard's temple. The other hand curled around Zane's wrist, pressing places between the bones and twisting his fingers into a claw. Zane screamed, but Jordel ignored him. He leaned in close and whispered into the wizard's ear, words too low and quick for Lauren to catch, and when she heard snatches they were in no tongue she knew. It sounded akin to, and yet unlike, the words Zane spoke when he made his fire. As she watched in fascination, Zane's eyes began to glow white. His face contorted as he screamed, jaw so wide she thought it might break. Bolts of fire and lightning leaped from his clawed fingers. They fell upon the mountainside above the cave and to either side of it, and everywhere they struck they exploded in great balls of flame. The mountain shuddered, the ground quaking beneath them. With a roar and a crash, great boulders fell from above. They piled together before the cave entrance, blocking it completely in a wall of rock. Dust fountained forth, covering all of them. Lauren turned away and flung up her hood to protect her mouth and nose from it. When silence had settled at last, she looked again at the cave. It was only a wall of stones, and looked like any other part of the mountain. "'Do what you will to me, Jordel,' said Zane, spittle flying from his lips, trying to reach around and claw at the mystic's face. "'I will never stop running from you. I will never stop trying to escape. One day when you are sleeping I shall break free again, and the next time I will not stop myself from—' Jordel released the wizard's hand and wrapped an arm tighter around his neck. He squeezed briefly for a few moments, and Zane fell senseless in his arms. Jordel turned him around, then heaved him up on a shoulder without effort. The wizard had wasted away to almost nothing now, and probably weighed less than half what he had when Lauren first met him. "'Will the satyrs be able to escape?' said Jordel. "'All these caves have back entrances,' said Alburn. "'They are like a honeycomb, every cave connecting to every other.' The satyrs dig them that way in case they need to run from attack. But we have time to get away before they emerge. I do not ask for our safety, said Jordel quietly. I would not wish the clan to suffocate because of Zane. Beasts they may be, but they do not deserve that. If you think they can find a way out, then let us go. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R dot com. Today's letter is O. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.